Leith Van Onselen, Chief Economist at the MB Fund, MB Super, joins us every Saturday morning around this time. Macrobusiness.com.au, a brilliant publication uh, online each day about um, the financial world in which we live and how government deals with it and other, other things. I, uh, I get it every day and read it, and I reckon it's a good thing to do. And Leith Van Onselen is on the line for our weekly chat. How are you, my friend? Good, thanks, Luke. Thanks for that glowing uh, introduction. I am happy to provide that. Based on my experience, it's uh, it's well-deserved, mate. Lots of things to talk about this week. Let's start first with Premier or former Premier Dominic Perrottet's speech to the Property Council. Uh you are kidding me, are you, that he actually referred to lazy immigration and a Ponzi scheme? That's right, mate. It was, look, <laughs> Australian politicians have this knack, right? So once they, as soon as they leave office or they, you know, they're no longer the boss, they start telling the truth, right? So we saw it, we saw it a couple of, you know, years ago when Joe Hockey uh, uh, basically, you know, left as being treasurer he, in his last speech to parliament. He suddenly said, look, negative gearing's bad. We should get rid of it after defending it for years. Um, you know, we see it all the time. So basically, yeah. you know, politicians become honest once, they, once they're once no longer in charge. And <laughs> we saw it again with, uh, you know, the former Premier, Dominic Perrottet. So basically, as uh, listeners might remember, in 2021, uh, when he took over the premiership from uh, from Gladys, um, he actually said that, it, that, you know, Australia needed this, quote, time-limited doubling of pre-COVID immigration levels. He came in saying that we needed big New South Wales. It was un- unashamedly... Um, you know, in favour of basically du- doubling the immigration intake yes. for a period of five years. Now, obviously, the Albanese government's pretty much done that, uh, only for a year, not for five years. And now Dominic Perrottet, now he's no longer the leader, went to the Property Council and he said, guess what? You know, we're running a lazy immigration system that's a Ponzi scheme and basically the states are overburdened, the Feds get most of the benefit because they, they collect most of the tax revenue from company taxes and personal income taxes. And the states are basically getting ripped off and we need to moderate it. He also complained that he's got, I think, seven kids or something like that. And they're um, and they're going to struggle to afford housing. And uh, and that basically nothing's keeping up. We're not building enough homes, we're not building enough infrastructure and all this sort of thing. And it's a lazy way to grow. So, look, he's basically saying, that he, look, what he said was 100% correct. We all know it. The, different, the problem with it is he talked in a very different book to what he did two years ago yeah. or two and a half years ago. And, yeah. and and now he's sort of, he's had this this Damascus moment where he's finally telling the truth. And this is what always happens, you know, like it always happens. As soon as the politicians leave, they become honest. <laughs> um, but, 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 that, that, but that being Love said, that. Yeah. that being said, what he said is 100% correct. It is a Ponzi scheme and it is unsustainable and we need to dial it right back. Yeah. And we all know it. You know, you live in Sydney, you're... You, you, you live with the traffic congestion every day. You're seeing high-rise dog boxes going up all around you. Your quality of life's getting worse. The housing affordability is absolutely shocking. Uh, you know, your rental market's an absolute disaster. The median house price in Sydney is now $1.6 million. I mean, how how's anyone going to afford that? Yes. Even an apartment is, you know, unbelievably expensive, over a million dollars. It's just it, it's just become a nightmare. And that's the reason why so many Sydney siders are moving north to, north to Queensland because they can't afford to live there anymore. And the federal government's basically, you know, fire hosing in a whole bunch of net overseas migrants because Sydney still gets the most. But then that's like pushing on one side of a balloon. It's pushing the existing residents out of Sydney. Yeah. So it's, uh, you know, it, it's an unsustainable situation. And, and according to the official data, I mean, Sydney's population is meant to hit about 9 million people in the 2060s. Mate, I had, I had a bloke ring me. I was um, filling in on the drive show this week and I had a fellow ring me and he said, mate, I've, I've had enough. Lived here all my life. I'm picking up um, the um, the travel van. I think today, and we're we've sold up and we're moving out. It's just we've had too too much, and he's now got to travel a place and see family in regional parts of the country. And you're right, given given all of that and and how busy and congested it is in in our cities, it's. Madness that we keep voting for this stuff. I mean, I I, I still don't understand why, uh, as a, a collection of voters, we don't demand population policy be disclosed each time we go uh, to the polls. We demand that from the major parties. They just, you know, they they get in one side more than the other. 
uh, but they both do it. They ramp up the population, that false and fake growth, and then we get a smaller share of the pie and we just cop it all the time. Yeah, and, and one of the problems there, Luke, is that basically the three major parties, so, you know, whether it's Coalition, Labor or the Greens, they all support the same policy, so the voters yeah. aren't really given a choice. True. And, and and also, I also slate some of the blame on the Australian Treasury. The Australian Treasury are the ones who pump this to the government of the day uh, because they love it because, um, you know, high immigration basically juices the federal budget, which is what the Treasury cares about because you get more company tax receipts, you get more personal income tax receipts because you've got more people to tax and more, obviously, demand in the economy. But they never look at the downside. So... They don't look at state government budgets, which, you know, they're all swimming in, drowning in debt. Yes. Because they can't keep up. And the states are obviously, the feds collect 80% of the revenue. The states have to spend most of the money to keep up with it because they're, they're responsible for schools and infrastructure and hospitals and that sort of thing. Yeah. So, unfortunately, you know, the, the costs aren't internalised to the federal government. The federal government just gets the benefits and then it, then it outlays the costs. And, you know, we always laugh about China. China does a build it and they will come approach. So they build all these cities and people call them empty cities before the population comes, whereas in Australia we just bring the people in and we pretend to worry about the consequences later and we don't build it. Yeah, yeah. And then even worse, if you dare to speak out too much about uh, about immigration, then they introduce the old uh, racist um, part of the argument. Oh, how could you suggest that? You know, it's, ah, oh, mate, it's just so, it's so poorly discussed uh, this issue in this country. I want to move on to productivity. I know Michelle Bullock had a bit to say about this yesterday, the Governor of the Reserve Bank. Is Australia a productivity sinkhole and why is that? Yeah, it is, mate. It's a, it, it's funny. So as you said, the uh, Governor of the Reserve Bank uh, fronted up a parliamentary inquiry yesterday and basically said that Australia's got to get its productivity performance up if you want to obviously have real wage growth, which is which is correct. But, um, you know, the thing about it is uh, th- th- there's a r- very good economist named Justin Farbo who runs a site called Antipodian Macro, and he did a study uh, basically, you know, plotting Australia's productivity growth. So this is GDP per hour work, which is the main figure, against a whole bunch of advanced nations. And turns out, you know, this is the US, Canada, the Euro area, New Zealand, et cetera, in the UK, and we're the worst. So, so, so we've effectively had no productivity growth since 2016. So uh, whereas, um, you know, other nations have at least grown a bit and Canada's is the second worst. And I basically attribute this to um, effectively, it's not the only reason, but w- one of the main reasons is that Australia is running this big, big, big immigration system. So effectively what's happened is we've, we've experienced a period of, or a long period of what's called capital shallowing. So that's effectively when, when your population grows faster than your business investment, your infrastructure, your housing, you get less capital per person. Mm. And what that means, that, that basically destroys your productivity. So the way, you know, a, a, as a regular punter, um, you know, living in living in Australia, Sydney, whatever, you see it through, for example, high congestion, right, which is productivity destroying. So you're bringing all those people, you don't build enough infrastructure for them, it takes you longer to get from A to B, That's that wrecks productivity. And that's effectively what Australia's economic model has been. Uh, since the mid-2000s when we massively ramped up immigration and we haven't built anything to keep up. And um, the, the interesting thing is the other country, which also has incredibly poor productivity performance, is Canada, which has done exactly the same thing. So Canada's got all the same problems of, uh, as us. They've, um, they're have they running a massive immigration program that in 1.2 million last year, so they're even worse than us. Jeez. And um, some excellent economists at the National Bank of Canada did a massive study uh, last month, and they basically said that Canada is caught in a population trap because they're getting this capital shallowing problem, and the, basically that's the driver of their productivity. And Jared Minak, who's a great Australian economist, did the same thing for Australia in November, and they, he found the same thing. Um, one of the main reasons for Australia's productivity, you know, poor productivity performance is because we've been growing the population much faster than we've grown infrastructure and business investment and those sorts of things. So that's so that's a fundamental reason, but unfortunately. You'll never see, you know, the Reserve Bank governor say that we need to slow immigration down so that the population grows at a slower rate than cap- than business yeah. investment yeah. infrastructure. They, they never say it. They always point to these other things and they talk in motherhood statements and they never call out the elephant in the room. Yeah. And, and you know, we often, and we're, we're stuck in this conversation now about um, the, the housing supply, particularly in the rental market, which has uh, seen rents go through the roof, all these new uh, residents wanting somewhere to live, hoping to rent somewhere, uh, increased demand, but there's no increase in supply. So we talk about properties, but 
It's not just that. That's the point, isn't it? It's not just the homes. It's the everything. It's everything. It's everything. Exactly right. Um, how Australian workers are getting smashed by cost of living, not just reflected in CPI inflation figures. Tell us about the work you've done here and what you've found. Yeah, so so the Australian Bureau of Statistics, every quarter after the CPI data comes out, the CPI inflation data comes out, they release this um, uh, living cost indice. So what it basically does is that it calculates uh, the living costs of different cohorts of the population. And to nobody's surprise, if you're an employee household, so you're basically a household with people in the labour market, um, your cost of living is has risen a lot faster than inflation. Shock horror. We all know it. Uh, so basically, in the year to uh, in la- last calendar year, um, according to the ABS, employee the average household household's cost of living rose by 6.9% versus 4.1% CPI inflation. And the main reason for that is that the CPI uh, inflation measure doesn't factor in mortgage costs. So basically, as we all know, the Reserve Bank's uh, ramped up interest rates. Uh, mortgage costs have all gone through the roof and this cost of living index is, counts that and because of that the cost of living's gone through the you know gone through the roof and uh, basically you know and, and, and the other the other thing that's not calculated by this uh, Luke but we all know is um, obviously we're we're paying a lot more in income tax so uh, last in, in the year to September um, income tax receipts went up 22 hmm. percent whereas overall household incomes only went up seven and a half percent so oh. so we're getting smashed on both sides we're, we're paying a lot more in in, in uh, personal income tax through bracket creep at the same time our cost of living has gone up and the interesting thing about this the one cohort whose cost of living has gone up less than the inflation rate are self-funded retirees and the reason for that is um, they overwhelmingly own their homes outright so they're not getting smashed by high rents now, rising rents and they're not getting smashed by more high mortgage payments and because they're self-funded retirees they're also not working so they're not getting smashed by personal income taxes so this is so so, so this is you know just a case of uh the pain of adjustments falling on certain segments of society uh, mostly through interest rates and rents while other segments of society are you know basically sitting pretty mm. always good to chat mate have a great weekend i'll talk to you next week Thanks, Luke. Thank you. you. Bye-bye. Leith Van Onselen, macrobusiness.com.au. We've got Rob on the open.